Hello and welcome back to the What the Fork Sunland preview show. Alex Neal's new look Sunland look very much like Lee Johnson's old one and are now on a run of just one win in the last 10 games. And we do approach a tough away game at our former automatic promotion rivals Wigan Athletic. But while the players have decided to quit on us, the podcast certainly hasn't. And the preview show must go on, even if I'm still a little high from this morning's anaesthetic after my operation. But uh, like I say, show must go on. So does the packed out away ends. Another sold out away end this weekend at Wigan Athletic. And the preview, the last season so far, and Saturday's upcoming game is a returning guest in Adam from Wigan Podcast Progress with Unity. Adam, I'm a little spaced out, mate, but how are we doing? Are you all right? Yeah, not too bad, actually, yeah. Uh, if I'd have known you were spaced out, I'd have had a few beers to sort of uh, <laughs> equalise it a little bit, but I am working early tomorrow, so, uh, yeah, Stone Cold Sober tonight. I'm sober technically, but technically the pinkle, yeah, the pinkles were good. Um, I was scared of anaesthetic, now I am not. Um, <laughs> as always, Adam, first things first, uh, you took a massive win yesterday uh, at Wickham. Once again, which we'll come on to, but netting two like late goals puts you three points clear of third place with I think three games in hand. How good and, and how important was that performance last night? Well, it was the second half was fantastic. I mean, I think the first half was relatively even, um, but Wickham are quite a direct side and uh, we struggled to handle them early on in the game. And I think probably on balance, they deserve the lead at half time. We came out in the second half and it was a different team. The, the football was superb, um, just one touch, movement, energy, composure at the back. Uh, then we tweaked it a little bit after about an hour, made a couple of substitutions. Um, I think that just kicked us on even further. Uh, your mate, Max Power with a very much uh, improvised free kick from 40 yards. So he caught the goalkeeper unaware. And uh, he's fumbled it and Nervous put it in. Uh, and then uh, two brilliant goals from uh, Callum Lang. Uh, one, a, a Porches finish at the far post, and the other one using some tenacity to break through and then slip it in the corner. Very, very comfortable. Could have had more. Um, probably our best half of football maybe all season and certainly since the Bolton game when I think we scored three goals there in the second half. So, um, I mean, if going off that one, a direct form line uh, with Wigan's 4-0 win and Sunderland's 6-0 defeat. <laughs> but we're probably not best, best not mention this so early in your podcast, though we might get a few... Uh, <laughs> PTSD. I was going to say, PTSD, when you mentioned Bolton there, you might have... People obviously can't see the... See us here because it's not an, it's an audio podcast, not a video one. But I think there's a, a quick kind of like flicker there of my eyes when you mentioned Bolton and a bit PTSD. Um, I think, you know, admittedly, as well, to be honest, Adam, I think a lot of Sunderland fans said this. And just to kind of give a more clarity, any Wigan fans that might be listening, I, I think because we've been in the situ same situation many times and messed it up, I thought February would be a tough month, especially with the, the games in hand, because as many times Sunderland have been in the position where we've had games in hand and royally messed it up. In fact, every time, pretty much, apart from this season. So I think a lot of, especially with myself, I said, you know, Wigan have got the games in hand, but they have to win them. You know, however, um, February's have been a really tough month for you, but you've navigated it really well. You've you've been Charlton and Wickham, drew with Rotherham, drew with Oxford and lost only at Sheffield Wednesday. And, and I mean, just the names of the clubs you play in, they were difficult. How well have, have Wigan navigated February, which is a really tough month for you? Yeah, it didn't obviously didn't start too well. And, and that was followed through really from towards the end of January. We didn't really start the year well, albeit we were winning matches. We weren't playing very well, just playing in sort of little spells, but getting through games. Then we had the... 0-0 draw against uh, Cheltenham, which was the first time in the season that we hadn't actually scored in a league game. Uh, that was then followed by uh, a cup defeat at Stoke, where we didn't score again, and then an away defeat at um, Sheffield Wednesday, when we didn't score again. Uh, now, during that period of time, as you will be aware of, the sides behind us were not really putting the pressure on like they could have done. And I think that 
meant that we could then go into two very important home games against Charlton and Crew without the pressure that we probably should have been under at that time, that the club, the other clubs should have been creating. Um, obviously, yourselves and Wickham have really struggled. MK Dons have been really good, but if they came from a bit further back, so they, they, they haven't really put the pressure on. Uh, so... Yeah, essentially, you know, we've we, we've won two home games, played okay against Charlton, albeit we went behind, and then just managed the game against a very poor crew side to win 2-0. Um, but obviously since then, we've gone to Rotherham in what was a really pulsating game and got a, got a well-earned point there. Very difficult circumstances, shocking weather, albeit... If we'd have turned up two days later, we'd have been underwater, I think, at Rotherham uh, from the pictures that I've seen there. Uh, and then obviously last night, you know, the, the penultimate game of the month and we get a fantastic 3-1 win having been 1-0 down at Wickham. So, yeah, we, we've we navigated our way through February very well um, the, the, the since the 1st of January. Um, we came back fresh. I think Liam Richardson's stroke of genius playing a full strength side against Oldham in the Papa John's trophy. Uh, we we got we got some minutes into the legs and we won 6 0 there. And I think that set us up quite nicely for January, given we hadn't played in three weeks. And we're now at a stage, I think, where as long as we're not complacent we should go on and win promotion. And I'd like to think we'd give it a little, a good push to uh, to win the title because Rotherham have got their month coming up, which looks quite difficult in March. It's funny you mentioned um, about promotion there. I, th I think it feels like a long, long time ago, but as a Sunderland fan, I remember being in really solid, good positions in sort of the end of February, March time. And, you always have that, well, oh, nothing, no one's won promotion yet, but you must, as a fan base, surely not just yourself, I don't be feeling, it would take a catastrophic fall from grace for now for you not to get up. Yeah, and, and to be fair, the, the, the previous three times we've been in this division when we've not been in administration, because obviously last season was just, it was horrible. You know, it was an absolute nightmare. Um to survive last season, I think as I've said previously, was possibly up there with winning the FA Cup. But apart from that, uh, the previous three times that we've been in this division, we've won the league. And slightly different seasons each time, but, but some similarities. And you can see where we're going with it. And when you've seen it before, remember Liam Richardson, albeit is a new manager at Wigan, you know, only, only sort of took over permanently the back end of last season, has seen it all before with Paul Cook. And it's quite interesting the way that Paul Cook has gone. I mean, he didn't really set the world on fire at Ipswich and he's made an iffy start now to his, to his non-league uh, return. You wonder whether Liam Richardson maybe was the brains in that operation. You don't know. Uh, or maybe they just work well together and Paul Cook struggles without Liam Richardson. But Richardson's seen it before, you know, in players like um, Max Power, has obviously seen a been through two promotions, one with Gary Caldwell and one with Paul Cook. So he knows what it takes. Jamie Jones, the goalkeeper, although he's not played a lot of games, he's got experience. Gavin Massey has got experience. And then there's other players who've experienced promotions with other teams. Add to that fearless young players, you know, Lang that we've mentioned who, He's fantastic, no fear at all. And, you know, there's no way that he's going to feel pressure. Will Keane from nowhere has just picked picked up form, you know, last season, going into this season, he's been absolutely superb. Uh, and and it's just strong, really. I mean, another link, obviously, James McLean, um, as you, you'll know, obviously, very well. I um, thought that was a great signing, his experience. Um, the, the fact that, he he's a brilliant player in an away match because the fans get at him and that's that's it. And, I, and it'd be interesting to see the reaction he gets from Sunderland fans 
because if you wind him up, he just gets better. Yeah, <laughs> he doesn't go. He, does. up, he doesn't go up. Maybe earlier in his career, he might have gone over the top. No, at Bolton, he was getting all sorts of stick all through the game, all about obviously his politics, and some of it was like way too far. But the way he handled it was scoring two goals and just laughing at them. So. <laughs> That's what your answer is, isn't it? Sometimes, to be fair, I, I tell you what I find really interesting, and you're probably not going to know the exact answer to this because I don't, and it seems nobody does. But you touch back on Wigan season last season, horrendous in many ways because no one wants to feel like the club might not exist. And let's be honest, it got to that point, and the fact you stayed up was miraculous, really, considering the problems that you had um, and the run that Liam Richardson and the team put together. But then you Obviously, you had a good summer. There was money popped back into it and there was good experienced players brought in. But I remember speaking on the first game of the season and you said, look, if we can make a push for the playoffs, that would be just nice because of the previous season that you'd had. Now, Sunderland have been here, it's looking likely, in my opinion, to be the fifth season at the very least. Even if we do get up this season, it's going to be through the playoffs and, and here for four seasons. And we've yet to build a side that can get an automatic promotion um, from this division oh, close to it once or twice but sometimes not even making the playoffs due to PPG and, and whatnot and the fans listening to this will know the reasons why with each, each season we've been unable to get a recruitment team at any point to get an automatic promotion side um, out of this division looks like Wigan's managed to do that in, in one window why do you think in your opinion obviously there's lots of different answers and opinions to it but why do you think Wigan have managed to do it whereas Sunderland have struggled for season after season and you've done it after a catastrophic season that almost ended up in administration, signed players that played for Sunderland last season and managed to somehow be quite clear and confidently should it be going up? That's a really good question. It's a really good question. And obviously there'll be a lot of variables in there. I mean, I, I think I'll start off with the manager, um, Liam Richardson, because... He's got that experience of working with Wigan before, and I think he knows. There's a funny thing about Wigan, the Wigan ethos, and a certain. They seem if we've got the right manager in place and we've got the right people behind the scenes, players can become legends at Wigan. And and a lot of the time, you know, you look back, players tend to then feed off that from the fans and. You know, it shows that the number of players have come back. You know, like McLean's come back, Powers come back. You know, we've obviously had other other examples of that as well over the years. And and the reason really is because it, it seems to just fit them. I think we talked off her, didn't we, that Max Power just didn't fit Sunderland, but he fits Wigan. He just seems to get it. Um, so I think. First of all, you've got to give most of the credit to the manager uh, because also as well, I think he's played a blinder with how he's utilised the young players. I think he, he hasn't... We were taught before, didn't we, about... Um, it might have been earlier on our podcast, actually, but we talked about Sunderland almost hanging the youngsters out to dry, really, in, in a sense, just playing, playing them non-stop, whereas Richardson has brought in some young players. I mean, Kel Watts, who's coming from Newcastle, very tempting there. You know, he's just signed a new two-year contract. They clearly rate him up there. But he's not been an ever-present for Wigan because he's a young player. So he's played 20 games, maybe, you know, which is manageable. But he, he's not he's not had a burden that is too much for him at this stage in his in his career. So I think I think the players that we've brought in have been managed well, but they were also the right type of players. I mean, Charlie White was completely different from what every Sunderland fan had said about him. He, I thought he was literally going to be in the box, score some goals, and it would be very dependent upon whether we could put the right sort of quality in. But obviously... Richardson and the team have looked at it and thought, well, actually, we don't need loads and loads of goals from Charlie White. We need a player who can hold the ball up and bring other players into the game. Something that a lot of Sunderland fans didn't think he had in him. But actually, I think he's one of the best that I've seen at Wigan at doing that. In fact, we've 
we haven't played up until last night. We haven't played anywhere near as well since obviously Charlie White had obviously that absolutely massive scare in in November, and you know, but for Liam Richardson being on hand and knowing what to do, and obviously the excellent work of the doctor on site, you know, we might we might he might not even be talking about him as a person now. So, you know, I think he was he was just fitting in nicely. And then the other players that he's brought in, he knew well. I don't know whether Sunderland, whether he was a manager that signed players that you really trusted. And what I mean by that is I think Liam Richardson signs players that he's known from young lads like Watmore, knew him from his Portsmouth days as a young lad. He knew Naylor as well. He knew uh, Grian Edwards. Um, you know, so there's a number of players there that he knew from a young age. So he trusted them and he trusts his players. And even if the, occasionally the fans get on their backs, um, he trusts them. He, he gives them a job to do. And a lot of fans... They're not professional managers. They might be on a football manager, but they don't know what the jobs uh, are asked of the players. And he's a good manager in sticking to his guns, you know, and, and he doesn't listen to the noisy minority. Uh, I think he his view is, you know, we've worked on this all week. We've got an excellent coaching team, which again helps, you know, Rob Kelly, James Beattie, very experienced coaches. So the team that's in place, the experience, I think, as well of the uh, Mal Brannigan, the CEO, who's had football experience previously. Uh, so it's not just a matter of you know bringing in some Bahrainians who essentially want to have a play a game with a with a, an English football club. They've put the right sort of people in there. We've also got Tom Markham who is, uh, he's the one who's responsible for the data for um, Championship Manager. So I suspect a lot of our work is data-driven as well, which if you look at Brentford, probably the best example of it. So I think there's a structure to it and it comes from the top. I'd say the key difference from what I'm seeing looking in at Sunderland at the moment is that maybe from the top down and people in, key positions in, in finance and in recruitment maybe don't have the structure, uh, the, if you like, the long-term methodology that they want to employ. And as a result of that, I think what's happened is exactly what you've been talking about, really, in terms of it just seems bizarre the way that Sunderland have recruited and sold players on this year. So, I think it's just just good management, really. And, yeah. and, and in terms of the finances as well, I just want to quickly mention that because it is something that's thrown at us a lot. Mm -hmm. But we're making a profit this this season. You know, we, we, we basically... Dan Byrne is a hero, and probably not for you because he's gone to Newcastle, but, you know, in the space of uh, a couple of years, we sold him, we sold him for £5 million. Then we got a 500 grand bonus last year because Brighton stayed up. And now we've got somewhere in the region of a couple of million because uh, he's uh, the sell on and Kiefer Moore as well. We've made money on him. So, it's a, you know, we're making we're actually taking money in um, and yet still assembling a good squad. You know, we haven't paid a lot of money in transfer fees. And yes, we will be paying a very good wage for League One level. But it, you can tell the players are not just here to pick up the wages, you know, for mm. one last sort of uh, a journeyman's last uh, outing at Wigan. That's what we used to be like in the 90s because we were the big spenders in this division in the 90s and we got journeymen who were not keen on sort of mucking in and getting the job done. These guys, team spirit straight away, bang, unbelievable. And, and you know, after four or five games, I changed my view. I said, this side has got a chance, a real chance of winning promotion, um, which is amazing, really. Five games, you don't usually get that sort of clarity as a fan. It's been a while since I've had that clarity with something being able to play football, let alone promotion. Or oh, maybe I'm being a bit harsh. But um, I did want to touch on one of the players. Obviously, you brought in three players from Sunderland. James McLean's obviously former as well, so we'll be coming up against two of them, I think. But Charlie White, you touched on there, started slowly, then began scoring goals. 
And then, frankly, like you touched on it yourself, it was a really shocking and, and frankly, really scary moment hearing that he'd had to receive C- um, CPR on the training pitch. And obviously, happened in the match yesterday with, um, sadly, with the Sunderland fan who, um, at the time of speaking, I just hope that he's he's doing okay and that him and his family are fine. But it's a, it's a scary moment. And obviously, it was really scary to hear what happened to Charlie, despite the fact that, you know, what his form was like, or your opinion was on him as a player. I think it's a horrible thing to hear. And everyone at Sunderland, wishes him and, and wished him well but we haven't really heard much since how is he getting on because obviously I'm, I'm quite curious to see how he's, he's getting on if he's okay yeah so he's uh, I think he's okay in terms of where he is at the moment medically which is the main thing you know end of the day it's a career it's something that you know most people dream of but ultimately you know it's not a life is it so I think that's the first thing that he's been I, I I don't want to go into the full medical. Uh, my background's law, not medicine. So, but essentially, I think he's had a uh, some sort of defibrillator fitted that can kind of monitor how the heart is. Um, so he, I think he might be doing the odd light bit of work at the moment. He's well enough to attend the games. He's been at the games. Um, uh, I don't think he's playing again this year. I think that's pretty pretty certain. Uh, but maybe get some hope. I don't know how similar it is to Ericsson, uh, but obviously Ericsson uh, coming through at Brentford, it looks like, you know, it clearly to sign a player of that value uh, with those risks, this day and age, the medical team must have looked at it and said, this guy is up, he's, he's up to it. So hopefully you'll get a little bit of hope from that. Um it's just uh, taking the time, really. You can't rush these things. It seems like uh, from bits of social media, he's in good spirits. The, the fans sing his name pretty much every game. I suspect they'll be singing it even louder on Saturday with it being against his former club as well. Um, but yeah, it seems like um, a real fans' favourite, really. So it was, it was a, it was odd, really, because I thought Sunderland fans would be gutted when he left, but it seemed like actually they saw maybe a different way forward. And to be fair, if you're going to say anything that's successful this season for Sunderland, it's the, the striker. Yeah. You know, it seems like you you, you lost one 30-goal season, man, and, and gained another one. Yeah, and, and I think, um, with all due respect to, to Charlie, and obviously I really hope he, he does recover enough to... Um, I would love to see him back on the pitch, to be honest, based on that. And I think Ericsson, seen him back on the pitch, he played a, a friendly up here in Glasgow against Rangers the other day. And there were some highlights and that was just amazing to see him back on the pitch because I think everyone obviously seen what happened. And I really hope the same can happen for, for Charlie as well, but he, at his own pace and obviously at the um, his health comes first out of everything. Absolutely, yeah. But I think also on the, on the pitch, from a, a perspective of Sunderland, you, you're right in what you're saying. The one thing that has worked out is in my opinion, Ross Stewart as an all-round player is is a big upgrade on Charlie White. Um, but one player that went that we were also in my, in my opinion, I was very happy for him to go. Not that I disliked him, I just thought we needed to move on. And not many Sunderland fans um, were totally devastated to see him go. But recently, a few people have gone, actually, come to think of it, maybe we haven't brought in players as good. And it's, you know what, it's, I think he's a bit of a more might player sometimes, but Max Power. Obviously, he's returned to Wigan Wigan, um, started pretty much where he carried off. He left, came to Sunderland, didn't get us promoted, didn't look like he could do. And then and he went back and finished his Sunderland career with a 40-yard shot over the crossbar in the 94th minute against Lincoln, just to sum up his time <laughs> here. But um, he's, gone to, he's, he's gone to Wigan, he's played right back, he's played central midfield and he's played great. I mean, why does the marriage of Max Power and, and Wigan go together so well and how important has he been this season? Well, he's been probably top three players because of his versatility. His set pieces have been absolutely superb. It's unbelievable. I mean, for basically... Are you sure it's Max Power, Adam? Are you yeah. sure that's Max Power you're speaking <laughs> it's about? It's unbelievable. <laughs> I know, and, and we did see it, to be fair, in his first spell. We liked him for a lot of things, but his set pieces was not one of them. But apparently James Beatty is a superb um, set piece coach. Um and he, he is a technically good player, but maybe, I don't know, maybe he was trying to do too much with the ball, possibly, and he just puts it into the air. First 10 games of the season, you may as well have just said power to Keane. 
because uh, it was like, well, he was kind of playing right back by accident, but he was our top assister. I think he had seven assists from 10 games and pretty much all of them were to, to Will Keane. Um, he's still not for me. I think, I think he's a player that can play in the championship at the bottom end of the championship and he'll do a job for you and he'll have certain games where he'll up his game against the top side. He played really well against Manchester City uh, four years ago in the uh, in the cup match that we won. He's not going to be a player that top eight, ten sides in the championship are going to look at, but he does fit Wigan very well. I think he fitted Tranmere very well and you know, I think he's a, he's got a young family. Um, I don't want to say this in the wrong way, really, for Sunderland, because I know that there's obviously, uh, you know, that there is still that there. You know, people, when they say big clubs are not family clubs, well, families still go to watch them. But I think there's a big difference for players like Max Power from playing at, at Wigan, where he feels quite comfortable in his space. He can... You know, he can have a chat with the fans in a way. And it's, I think Sunderland, with its its history, the size of the club, the fans, the pressure, you know, essentially, I suspect maybe this season there might have been second favourites behind Ipswich. But I think the previous times in this division, you've started as the favourites to win promotion. You know, and I know Wigan have had something similar, but I think Power was signed really to kind of say, look, Power, Greg, you know, those players were essentially signed to say, look, you've done it before with Wigan. You get us out of this division. Big pressure that. You know, Max Power at Wigan, when he came in, you know, particularly the last time he was, uh, the last season, he had players like Nick Powell around him, you know, that, you know, can pick up the slack, you know, in that in that type of situation, you know, so he could just go about his business. And again, you know, he, he just goes about his business. The big difference for me with him since he was last here is his leadership qualities. I think he you can see now the way that he deals with the younger players. He is the captain, really, in a sense. I mean, Derek is the is the club captain, but Max Power is the real captain on the pitch, really, who sort of organises everything. Um, yeah, when he first came back, I wasn't sure. I didn't know whether maybe he'd lost it because it looks like Grigg probably has. It doesn't look like he's setting the world on fire at Rotherham. I know he's injured now, but he wasn't exactly looking like a 25-goal-a-season player. No. Sometimes players can just lose it, but for Max Power, it reignited something in, inside of him. And maybe certain players struggle at that bigger club you know, and, you, and it's littered with players over the years, aren't there, who go to a bigger club. And what I mean in bigger in terms of history and uh, fan base, which, of course, leads to bigger pressure. And maybe in the end, you know, because maybe he doesn't get that leeway of two or three games like he would at, at Wigan. Maybe he doesn't get that at Sunderland, potentially. I'm not saying everybody, but maybe the... A couple of misplaced passes for a couple of games in a row, maybe that impacts on him and all of a sudden his confidence goes and he starts doing stupid things and trying to, like you said, shoot from 50 yards <laughs> and hitting it 100 yards over the top. So, yeah, I think players fit certain clubs, don't they? You know, we've seen, yeah. that, we've seen that before. I mean, so we've seen it the other side of it as well. You know, we've had players who've come into Wigan who looked awful. Like we had Ivan Tony, he just he looked, ter he looked terrible at Wigan, and uh, since he's left, he set the world on fire. It's <laughs> funny with with players like uh, you, you mentioned Max Power and, and players coming and stuff like that, and, and I, I really do think, and and I don't think there's anyone that actually disliked Max Power from a personality perspective. Look, I've never had a conversation with him, but he he went down Roper Beach. He used to always go into uh, uh, the coffee shop at Roper Beach and he really yeah. seemed to embrace the area. And when he scored for Sunderland and, and you know, let us out with Wembley and stuff like that, he seemed to really to really enjoy playing for the club. But it's, with all due respect to Wigan and, and, and other clubs he's played for, we're a vastly different club in many different ways. And there is pressures that come with playing for Sunderland. And I think... I think, honestly, certain players, like you say, if it's certain clubs and there's certain players, I think the one that sticks at the top of my mind is a current player, Jermaine Defoe, is just a player that just gets what it is to play for Sunderland. And, and some get it and some get it, but don't quite make it. 
Um, and I think Max Power is very much in that middle camp of he probably got it, but probably didn't quite have the the right fit for the, this football club. But then again, he lifted a trophy with us. So what am I talking about? It was only the it was only the pizza trophy, but a trophy's a trophy, I suppose, isn't it? But he might, he might lift it again this season. <laughs> I know, I know he might do, might he? Geez, he'd keep his record up. Um obviously it's a player that's not going to play on Saturday. Um, but I'm curious as to another player that you took. Jordan Jones, who I spoke to off air, saw him um, in Tesco, no, Sainsbury's, I think, the other day with his, his young man. Um, and I think many Sunderland fans would maybe agree with me on this and say that he showed flashes of genuine, unadulterated quality. Then his loan spell just sort of filled it out and he did absolutely nothing. Um, Rangers fans felt the same. There's fans of other clubs he's been at that felt the same, probably apart from Kilmarnock, who he did really well with. And I think that's where he built his reputation. He's gone on loan to St Mirren. He's went and played one game and scored an absolute screamer. I think we've all seen that. What did Wigan fans make of Jordan Jones? Obviously, I'm guessing it didn't really work out. Did see a lot of him, really, to be honest. I mean, earlier in the season, there was there was him and Grian Edwards, who were sort of the rotated substitute, an occasional player in, in some of the cup matches. Um, no, I did Nothing really to me. He had one, he had a 20, 25 minute spell against Sheffield Wednesday, came on a sub, turned the game really. Every time he got the ball, he looked like he could beat a man. And, you know, I've got quite a few Sheffield Wednesday friends and they said, you know, they were very lucky to come out with a win in the end. And, and he was part of turning the game. But then after that, you know, sometimes he looks... At times he didn't look like a footballer. It's really, really odd because, um, and I think you can get that sometimes with wingers. If if they maybe the confidence isn't there, everything goes to pot. You know, you're not really, you know, if you if you're not playing the, your best football in at centre midfield, you know, sometimes you can feel your way back in, get a good tackle in, or play a few short, nice little short passes, and you just get feel into the game. But you just look like. He didn't feel that he could beat the player. You know, sometimes he was kicking the ball at a player too far when he was running onto it. It just didn't work out for him. But, you know, he might be another of those. He's obviously got a bit of talent about him. Mm-hmm. You know, he's an international, you know, playing at a, you know, not the not the top international side, but, you know, a side who are reasonable and he's he's playing quite a few games for, the, for them. Um, but it's not worked out. And I, I just don't really... I can't, I can't see where where he comes back in, to be honest. And uh, it seems from what I gather that he's had a that he had a decent spell in Scotland previously, and, mm-hmm. and maybe maybe that's that's where his future lies. I, I don't know for certain, but um, obviously, you know, with anybody, you know, he's not done anything wrong at the club. It sometimes just doesn't fit, and uh, you know, best of luck to him. Really, you know, I'd, I'd like to think you know anyone who's been through Wigan. You know, has has contributed something. <laughs> it's just that he hasn't contributed very much as yet. Hundred percent sounds like the same Jordan Jones that Rangers and Sunderland got. Kilmarnock fans might disagree. They think he's great. Um, <laughs> I think it's fair to say that the Apple Cart would be upset if Sunderland won, based on just the form of both sides and the way the season's gone. But in a really odd way, we've beaten you twice this season. Once with um, first day of the season, which is difficult to judge, but good performance for ourselves. We pulled it back and won one nil down. God, things felt great then. And then we obviously went there in the cup and we've had a decent cup run this season. So on the face of it, Sunderland have won two games against Wigan this season and we go into Saturday's game as massive underdogs. But if Sunderland are to upset the upper car, if Sunderland are to stop our bad run and, and shock Wigan this weekend... Which of the players from what you've seen in previous games do you think could be the ones that would be the, the spearhead of it? Well, there's the one obvious one, isn't there? <laughs> End of the day, he stands out like a sore thumb, doesn't he? With 20, it does. 20 goals, really. You know, it's. Uh, I think that, I'm presuming that's his record in all competitions, isn't it? 20. Yes, I think so. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Um, I mean, I think I said at the start of the season, you know, like the fact that you've, you know, you've got Pritchard in who... You know, essentially, I, I, I'm sure he was about, was he about a, a £10 million player a couple of years ago? I think he was 14, if correct me if yeah. I'm right. I mean, you can see it. Why? Yeah, and I just, I mean, he's, it looks like he's had a, a few assists. Um, you know, so 
I think he assisted last night from from what I remember on the reports for yeah, the, the equaliser last night. So you've pretty much nailed it in seeing Stuart and Pritchard, who are by far, far and wide, even in this bad run, our best two players. What's to happened to McGeady? Honest. Injured currently. Currently injured. So he's unlikely to be there on Saturday. I think he's due back in a few weeks, but he's been out for a couple of months and then he got injured in October, November. Yeah. I mean, oh, there's a few in there who are certainly you. Re- the, the names mean probably more than the way that they're actually performing. Yeah, though, I mean, the the ones that you know when you watch your when you watch your quest, you know, you already get the highlights, don't you? So the, yeah. who, who's, the, who's the ones that you're going to remember? The one who's would be scoring all the goals, really, and, uh, and, 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 good, and some good and some good goals as well. Um, you know, so. Like I said, they've got to be the players that we look out for. And I think you'd probably say that for different reasons, they're both probably playing at least a level down to where they should be playing at, in my view. Um, I think you'll hope it doesn't come to this, but the test of that, I think, will be next season if you don't go up, whether those yes. players will still be will still be at Sunderland or... Whether they it becomes a continuation of the sort of uh, the, the the direction of travel from Sunderland to Wigan, and we end up signing those two. <laughs> either Portsmouth or Sunderland, they seem to be it seems to be a good method of recruitment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, neither of us like going up, meet us in Portsmouth. So yeah, I suppose it's a it's a decent place to look at. But um, I'm not confident for Saturday. It would be very Sunderland for us to win. Um, but I'm I'm not confident on Saturday. I predicted us to get beat last week, and I was right. Um, I think I'm going to say the same again. I think we'd be quite comfortable. Um, I said in your podcast, two one or three nil. I'm going to go three nil. Um, or th- well, I'll go three one. I think we're confident in scoring, but our defence is a mess. Um, but what, what what's your prediction for Saturday? And I'm guessing you're going to agree with me, surely. Yeah, I mean. It- it look, I've, I've predicted a win on the podcast, but I went narrow. I think a big, big crowd will be on Saturday. I mean, we're going to have given some, uh, they've had an offer on with the season ticket holders as well. So they can bring um, a couple of people with them uh, for one off. So I, I suspect the, the home end is going to be very, very busy. Um, might be the biggest crowd we've had since the Premier League days. So I think in that highly charged atmosphere, the weather, I can't see it cracking the flags, to be honest. And uh, I don't think we'll be having drinks breaks for the weather. So it it could be. I remember one game against Sunderland, uh, God, it's probably about 10 years ago now in the January, and it was absolutely horrendous weather. The, the driving rain, Sunderland won 4-1, I think. Oh, I was there, yeah. Yeah, David driving Ball, yeah. rain and it flooded. I remember that said it all, but basically awful defeat. And we were walking back uh, and the bridge that we normally walk under, it was completely flooded. Uh, so we had to walk all the way, all the way around. <laughs> basically, it was about an extra two miles on our journey. So, um, yeah, it could be that type of game. And usually in that type of game, it, it becomes a bit of a battle. Um, yes, which might not be a bad thing possibly for Sunderland at the moment if it doesn't, if Wigan can't flow with the football. So I've gone for a tight one for Wigan by a goal to nil. Um, Wigan's home record against Sunderland hasn't been fantastic. Over, I mean, we had the we had the lockdown win, which was a massive surprise last season. Although oh, yeah. I think Sunderland were just starting to lose the form a bit, but you know, again, we, yeah, <laughs> um, but. You know, over the years, I think Sunderland have come up with a few wins in big games. You know, I remember the the one 0 the year that Sunderland got promoted as champions when we finished second. Marcus Stewart, yes, I remember yeah, that very well. Filled, filled the uh, oh, the East Stand at the time that was being used, which was eight thousand, I think. And I also remember um, the previous season, I think, towards the end of the season, which was a nil-nil, but I think it was it might have been on a Sunday, and, and again, Sunderland, I think, brought the full 8,000, 8, and then we had the battles in the Premier League, you know, the first ever Premier League win for Wigan, Jason Roberts penalty against Sunderland, and and we also beat Sunderland, I can recall, uh, after we'd lost to Spurs 9-1. We beat Sunderland one 0 <laughs> so so maybe you you can take some hope from that after a, an awful run of form. Maybe this this is the game that turns it around for you. But 
I, I honestly expect us to win narrowly, but in a funny sort of way, I don't think a point is a bad result for us. And I suspect Sunderland might see that as a, a reasonable result as well. Given that you're predicting a 3-1 defeat, I think you'd see a point as a reasonable result. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I'd take a draw. We were in good form and got beat 5-1 in Rotherham, and I think that, you know, we, we need to start picking up results and, and we're going to waste one of the more difficult games towards the end of the season, if not the most difficult on paper, because Rotherham's obviously at home, so yeah, I'd, I'd probably snap your hands up for a draw. I'd snap your hands up for just anything positive, um, <laughs> to be completely honest with you. But you never know. Football is a funny game. But Adam, um, thanks as always for joining me. I get the feeling I might not be seeing you next season, but you never know. Funny things have happened. Well, I hope you enjoyed my trip up to Sunderland last year. So if we go up automatically, what you need to do is keep this bad run going and then steam into the playoffs with seven wins in a row. And get get promoted, and then I can have my night eight in Sunderland again. It was a good one last year in August. <laughs> we do do a good night. We just don't do good football. That's all, mate. But um, as always, to everyone listening, subscribe if you want. If you don't, that's fine.